My goal in this video is to do a high level overview of how large language models generate text and give you some practical tools to actually influence the way that they do it too. When we talk about generating text, what we're really talking about is generating tokens. This is important because models never actually see your original text. They only see the tokenized form of it. That's one reason why LLMs can't do simple tasks like count the words or characters in a sentence reliably. A model can only interpret your text based on the tokens in its vocabulary, which are assigned meaning during the training process. So every model has a vocabulary, and this is something that's set before the model is trained. Llama 2 and Mistral vocabularies are both 32,000 tokens long, and the GPT vocabulary is 50,000 tokens. It may seem like larger vocabularies are probably better, but there's actually a trade-off. So a larger vocabulary could mean that larger words or more domain-specific terminology gets assigned its own meaning from the training data, which could be good in certain situations. But if it's training on those tokens, then it's not training on other tokens. And it can also just require more memory and, uh, for training and inference. Now the thing about tokens is that they cover a lot of ground. So one of the big things that they deal with is spaces. There's actually a lot of redundancy in tokens where some have a space appended to the beginning and others don't. Capitalization is another thing. Red with a capital R may not be the same as red with a lowercase r. You also have all kinds of symbols, emojis, and punctuation. Numbers, you might have tokens for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. You might go all the way up to 100 where each number has its own token. But at some point you have to have a cutoff because numbers go to infinity and we can't have infinite tokens. So that's a decision too. At what point do numbers stop having their own tokens? And of course, just imagine all the different languages that we want large language models to support effectively and how many different characters and little symbols there are in different languages. So in order to be effective, tokens have to try to encompass all of these things without just growing um, completely out of control in terms of the size of the vocabulary. I pulled an excerpt from the GPT vocabulary. So here are some tokens. What you have is a number in one column, that's the token ID, and then you have the characters it represents. And pay attention where there's a space. So in the first one, we have space den with a capital D. I live in Denver. I'm like, hey, that's my token. 5602, rent with a space in front of it. We have capital TA. It looks like the end of the word journey without the J. Arc capital S, lowercase u, the number 97, um, changing. Here's a whole bunch more. So you can see 5613 is the name Peter with a space in front of it. Do you have your own name as a token? I don't know. And then if you look at the very bottom, 5619, we have a right parenthesis with a space in front of it and a semicolon behind it. Tokens have to do a lot of stuff. And in a perfect world, we wouldn't have to think about tokens. It should just be abstracted away. But in reality, tokens can make a big difference on how the model actually performs, especially with spaces, uh, which I'll show you in a little bit. But before we get to that, let's also talk about special tokens. These are tokens that are controlled by the system. And so they're used in very specific ways. A good example of this is the stop token. This is a special token that tells the model when it should stop generating text. It's also called the end of sequence token. You can also add special tokens. So this is one exception to all the tokens have to be decided before pre-training. You can add special tokens during fine tuning. And this is really useful for chat based models that have, let's say a system prompt. So you can designate the system prompt with a special token before and after it, but it tells the model that this is more important. This prompt should be followed and then the other prompts are user input and they're not necessarily to be trusted as much. And those are similar. They can be uh, separators between the messages. So you can have a token that you start a message with and then token that indicates it's from the user or it's from the assistant. And in a multi-turn chat situation, these tokens help the model keep track of the chat conversation, and who's saying what. Okay, so hopefully you have a good idea of what tokens are. Let's talk about how the model actually produces a token for us. Now there's a lot of confusion that could come up at this point. Just like tokens have some redundancy, in machine learning, unfortunately, there's a lot of redundancy in different terminology. So as I'm talking about this, I'm gonna use words like inference, generation, prediction, completion, 
and output. And these all essentially mean the same thing. It's we're getting the model to generate text for us. Inference is the most official name for this, but generation is also super common. So what is inference? It's predicting the next token in a loop. See, I'm already using these terms to define each other. The key thing here is that this is in a loop and we're predicting. So there's some probability involved. Now, the way this works is that you start with a prompt. Let's say a long time ago in a galaxy, you just want to finish it, right? Then the model is going to take that, it's going to turn it into that list of tokens. It's going to create embeddings. It's going to apply the attention mechanism through the transformers architecture and do a lot of math and linear algebra. I'm going to breeze past that to make sure that we're just covering the high level concepts here. But what we get out, this is important. What we get out from all of that math that the model does is a list of tokens. And each token has a probability assigned to it from the model. So at this point, we got a list of tokens. Uh, which one are we going to return? We use a sampling strategy. And this is where almost all of the inference parameters or the control settings kick in. So there's temperature, top P, top K, frequency penalty, repetition penalty, and individual token biases. We are going to focus on temperature and top P in a little bit after we finish discussing how inference works. So from the list of tokens, what we want to do is we want to select a token. Once we do that, then we have a new prompt. We add that new token back into our prompt. So a long time ago in a galaxy far, now the model or the system needs to make a decision. Do we stop? And the two reasons that the model would stop generating are if it reached the stop token, which is a token it can specifically generate to stop because it thinks that it's done based on all of its training, or it simply hit the maximum length that we specified. So there's usually a max new tokens type of parameter where you can say how many tokens you want the model to generate. And if it hits that limit, it'll stop. Now, if it didn't stop, we repeat that whole loop again using a new prompt. And then hopefully we come away with a completion like far, far away. What a lot of people don't understand about this process is almost all of it is completely deterministic. All of that math that the model does, there's no probability of it doing it differently next time. It's going to do it the same way each time given the same prompt. However, at the point where we select a token from the list of probable tokens, we have a choice to make. Do we want it to be random? How random do we want it to be? We can make it completely deterministic by simply choosing the most probable token from the list every time. These parameters like temperature, top P, they allow us to have some degree of control in this process. Let's talk about how to work with those parameters to change the probabilities. Temperature controls the randomness of the probabilities. There's this nice little feature in the OpenAI Playground called Show Probabilities, but essentially it shows you that list of probabilities for each token. Here in the complete area of the playground, which is legacy, and I don't know how long it'll be around, but we have it for this video at least, we can turn that on in the OpenAI Playground, just set it to full spectrum or most likely, and then go ahead and change your max tokens to one so that we can just generate one token and look at its probability. Now I'll start typing, once upon a time there was a, I intentionally removed that space at the end. Let's go ahead and run that. There was a very, okay. So if we click on very, which is highlighted red, we can see which tokens were up for selection. And it shows this one, Very, which had a 1.97% chance of being selected. And this token, Little, at the top had a 7.08% chance. So that was the most likely token. If we wanted it to actually select the most likely token, we can set temperature to zero. Now, if we run it again, we get Little. And if we delete that with temperature at zero, we get Little again. It's going to give us the same output every time. Now here's what I was talking about when I said that we shouldn't have to care about tokens, but actually sometimes it matters. So I don't have a space at the end here, but if I add a space and I go down here and I submit, I get this warning. Your text ends in a trailing space, which causes worse performance due to how the API splits text into tokens. And it gave me the number 10. And all these others are just numbers too. 
So clearly something is wrong. That simple space, whether it was there or not, actually had a big effect on the output. Okay, so that gives you a little peek into temperature. Let's talk in detail about the different ranges of the temperature setting. So temperature is typically in a range of zero to two. Zero is treated as selecting the most probable token. Another term for this is greedy sampling. Close to zero is actually almost the same thing as setting it to zero. And one uses the model's default probability outputs. So if you just want it to select randomly from the probability distribution that the model generated, you can leave it at one. This is still pretty random and gives a lot of directions the model can go in. If you set temperature to greater than one, so that one to two range, what happens is it starts to squeeze those probabilities together, increasing the odds that a less likely token gets picked. And I have a handy dandy Google spreadsheet to see how this works. So in our Star Wars example, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, that token far, this log prob column shows what the model thought was most likely, and it was very likely to pick far. Okay, but it could have picked not. It had a 3.4% chance of that. Notice my temperature is at one. So over here in this far right column that says softmax, we have the exact same probabilities. Um, if you set temperature to 0.5, what it's doing is it's less than one, so it's pushing the most likely tokens up in probability and sending the lesser likely tokens even further down. And like what I was talking about, as you get closer to zero, 0.1 or even 0.2, granted this is rounded to one decimal place, so it's not exactly 100%, but it's almost effectively 100%. So as you get closer and closer to zero, it might as well be zero. Technically, if you use zero, the math for this is undefined, so it can't calculate it, but you might as well treat it as zero because the numbers approach zero. And then as we go over one, so 1.5, pretty high temperature, this 86.2% for the token far came down to 70%, and then it started boosting these. So not went from 3.4% to 8.2%. And as you go higher with temperature, it's compressing them all together and making them closer together. Lower than one is pushing them further apart, creating a bigger difference and disparity. And then higher than one is kind of squeezing them together. Here's a really simple one with dog and cat as the possible tokens, hypothetical. If dog had a 75% chance, cat had 25%, and your temperature was really close to zero, you would get pretty much 100% on that dog token. And then at one, you see they're exactly the same. At 0.5, we go to 90-10 distribution. So 90% chance dog will get picked. 1.5, 67-32, they're coming closer together. They came a little closer there too. Notice it's not linear. Like going from 1.5 to 2 made a much less difference than going from 1 to 1.5. And in that range of 0 to 0.2, you might as well be just selecting the top token. So don't think of it as linear that if you just add 0.1 every time, you're going to have the same impact on the randomness. That's not actually how it works. There's ranges within temperature where it has a very dramatic impact like 1 to 1.5 and uh, 0 0.5 to 1 as well, where even small adjustments can have a big impact. Okay, so some practical advice for setting your temperature or the randomness of your outputs. You should set it to zero in certain situations, like for classifiers, when you want to have very specific classes output and you don't want it to pick something that it wasn't trained to select. Um, that's if you fine tuned a classifier. If you need reproducible outputs, so in software development, we have test suites. And it's very nice when your test suites are consistent, so you know if they're passing or you know if they're failing. The same is true with large language models for our evals. If we have a set of prompts and we have a set of completions that we expect to get from them that we know are good, 
we want to be able to consistently get those good outputs in our evals. You should also set temperature low when you have strict formatting requirements, such as for JSON or writing code. In JSON, for example, if you need it to end with a particular bracket because it defined a JSON object and it'll be invalid JSON unless it ends with a specific bracket, you don't want it to pick something other than that bracket because it'll break the JSON. Same goes with code. You need very specific syntax that the model will output and setting temperature higher works against that. And there are absolutely situations where it's nice to set temperature higher. For example, if you're looking for creative outputs, like storytelling or brainstorming, maybe you're looking for a list of ideas from a chat model, then a higher temperature will actually give you more interesting outputs for sure. And then I've also found anecdotally that higher temperature can lead to longer outputs. This may have something to do with it not selecting the stop token, but I actually think it has more to do with just this idea that the model will take different paths and directions that maybe it would have otherwise, and those can lead it on longer, more roundabout journeys to a conclusion. So top P is the other parameter we're going to talk about that's also super useful. What it does is it allows you to exclude less likely tokens from being selected. So let's say you had a model that gave you 10 possible tokens with associated probabilities. We'll just cut it in half, let's say. We set top P to 0.5. That means only the top 50% of the options will be considered. So we throw away the other half, we apply our temperature, and then we do our sampling. Um, so if you set top P to 0.1, then it would only consider the top 10% of the most likely tokens. Top P at 1.0 would be 100% of most likely tokens can be selected. That's usually the default. Think of it this way. You could try a higher temperature of 0.8 to 1.2, but if that was getting a little bit too wild for what you need, you could put that within bounds by using top P of say only the top 10 to 20% of the best tokens. And then what you're doing is you're giving the top 10 to 20% of the top tokens a pretty good chance for any of them to be selected. So it's kind of narrowing the funnel of possible outputs for you. So I'll leave you with this thought. There's a thin line between creativity and madness. And temperature, top P, it's not true creativity. What it's doing is kind of offering a proxy for creativity by adding some randomness, some chance to what you're going to get back. But the dark side of that is that you don't know what the model is going to do. You're giving it the opportunity to do something that um, maybe you don't want it to do. And I think for a lot of businesses and product teams, that's a pretty scary thought. In an ideal world, I think we'd be able to use these models without adding any randomness into it so that we could be more confident of what they're going to deliver to us. I believe that there has to be a way to train true creativity in the amount that we need for specific tasks into the models so that we can use them at a very, very low or zero temperature. And that's one of the many reasons that I'm very excited about fine tuning for specific tasks. Fine tuning is where you take a large language model and then you train it further and then it can perform better at that task and within a more predictable range. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. I'll be making more videos about lots of different AI topics and trying to go in depth while also keeping it very accessible.